Hello and welcome to the broadcast today. It is so good to have you with us. You're in for a real blessing. Um, I have a very dear friend and a very special guest. Tony Cook is with me today on set. And Tony, it is so good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Pastor Mark, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you. And I'm especially excited because your latest book uh, entitled The End of Spectator Church is out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the subtitle is Answering God's Call into Full Engagement. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, it is so powerful. I want to encourage all of you to visit Tony's website, Tony Cook. That's spelled with an E on the end of Cook, TonyCook.org. You know, Tony, you have written a lot of books. How many um, books are you up to now? Well, we have one at the publisher now, and it, the one at the publisher is number 16. So you're holding number 15. And if you family. don't slow down, they're going to give you a ticket. <laughs> I'm telling you, you, you are writing the book so fast. Thank you're you. starting to remind me of Rick Renner. I'm, I've got a long way to go <laughs> to catch up with Rick. Well, Tony, on a serious note, when I got a copy of this in the mail, I took one look at the cover. And the title, it's titled The End of Spectator Church. And by the way, I want to encourage everybody to get a copy of this. I just felt it was a now word and I hadn't even opened the book yet. And uh, first off, as we get started, give us some of your background. You know, we've known each other a lot right. of years and I assume time. that people know, but man, yeah. we're going way past 30 years now, yeah. maybe even 30. I think we first talked in the mid 80s, something like that. Man, are you getting old? No, no. Okay. But but I'm trying to, you know, stay young. So, <laughs> so well, tell but, us some of your background in ministry. Sure, you bet. Well, I grew up in north central Indiana, a community called town called Kokomo. Met my wife there, and we got married and moved to Rama Bible Training Center, Tulsa, to attend school. Um, we've been in ministry. We've been married for 45 years wow. as of June, 2024. Wow. And in ministry for 44 years as of June, 2024. And so taught at the Bible school, Rama for many years, was on staff there for a total of 18 and a half years. And, uh, associate pastor, directed ministerial association, things like that. Uh, in 2002, uh, Lisa and I stepped into full-time traveling, and we've been traveling for, um, well, since 2002, 22 years as of today, and um, we uh, have been in 31 countries. Uh, we've preached in 48 states, uh, have uh, Vermont and uh, Delaware to go. Haven't preached in those two states, but uh, and we love international. I've been to many countries. I just got back from Turkey. It was my 10th trip there. And I think Egypt was my fourth time, Lebanon my fourth time, and Russia seven times. We've been a, a lot of places several times. And um, so we just love what we do. Our assignment is to strengthen churches and leaders. Spent 22 years as an assistant pastor. So I kind of got to see the inner workings of the church. Um, I've never been a senior pastor, but uh, I got to see, and, and all that caused me to say, God, thank you that you didn't call me <laughs> yeah. to be a senior pastor. I got to help and, you know, work with all aspects of the local church and things like that, which really kind of helped lead us into this idea of the end of spectator church. While you're talking, I'm thinking of some of the books you've written. Uh, I want to mention, you actually went on and earned your master's yes. in church history. Mm -hmm. And then you wrote a book about miracles and the supernatural. Yes. Tell us just a little bit. Yes. Even though we're going to talk about Spectator Church, uh -huh. tell us a little about it because it fascinates me. Right. Well, I, I in my travels... Um, you know, I've been to Turkey many times. Some, some of that's been touring, like Ephesus and the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And I just got back from the southern coast of Turkey, where Paul and Barnabas were coming up from Cyprus and sailing out to go back to wow. Antioch. And been to Greece many times, the biblical sites there, and Rome and all these different places. And just love the ancient historical biblical sites. And um, I just got fascinated over the years in visiting Luther sites in Germany and 
and Calvin and, and Zwingli sites in Switzerland and Wesley sites in England. And I just fell in love with church history. And every time I'd visit a site, like I'd visit John Wesley's house and his church. So I got to learn more about Wesley. And so I, I made, you know, I, I eventually just told Lisa, I said, I've got to learn more about this because I, I knew things, but I had so many gaps. And so I enrolled in uh, Liberty University's, uh, let's see, it was uh, theological studies with a church history cognate and, and just loved that and uh, ended up learning, learn, knew many of the things already, but learned many more new things, especially about moves of God and mm-hmm. revivals. And I, I was able, after getting that uh, degree, I was able to go back, like for John Wesley, for example, um, you know, he prayed for his horse and his horse got healed. Mm. Uh, he, he documents in his own journal multiple people being healed at, at different points and times in his life. He talks about himself getting healed. He talks about um, uh, times when, you know, uh, the power of God would fall and um, people would fall on the ground and um, and just, but going back all the way to the earliest, of course, we know the New Testament record with the book of Acts, but then John's disciples, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, Polycarp's disciple, Irenaeus of Lyon, and just down through the centuries, all these guys are talking about healings, miracles, the supernatural. And so that's what we did. Uh, I, I, that was a, a previous book to the one you're holding and just um, loved researching God working and moving in multiple generations. So anybody who says when the last apostle died, God pulled out all the powerful gifts or the supernatural gifts, you can't read church history honestly and conclude that. You've got to see that, you know, through John Wesley, George Fox of the Quakers, um, even Martin Luther documents certain people that they prayed for that were healed Mm. and things of that nature, just all the way back through church history. You know, I I feel really blessed because a lot of times when you're writing a book, you'll share things with Mm -hmm. me. And and I want to encourage everybody to visit your website. It's on the screen there. Because the book you're talking about, one of the things I remember is basically you said there never has been a time that the Lord has left us without multiple witnesses and Mm -hmm. accounts of supernatural phenomena. Right. And it, and it, it, it kind of amazes me that we have people today that are educated and they think that the supernatural's passed away. Right. But your book, and help me with the title again, it's, uh, Miracles, miracles, and the supernatural throughout, throughout church history. Church history. Mm-hmm. So I encourage you to get a hold of that book. And boy, there's so many wonderful, rich things we could talk about. Mm-hmm. But really, the reason, and I appreciate you coming to be with us mm-hmm. because this book, I think, is a now word. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're in a time <clears throat> that we're about to see the greatest harvest that has ever come to the planet, and. And, you know, I was in a prayer meeting just not too long ago, and they were talking about, we don't need to pray for the harvest. We need to pray for the laborers. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, and it was white already. Now, I came from West Texas, so when wheat gets that little white tinge, the -hmm. the heads of wheat, what that means is if you don't get out there and get it out of the field, you're going to lose it. And so uh, this end of spectator church answering God's call to full engagement What prompted you to write this? Well, that was not the original title. The original title was going to be Army of God Rising. But somebody stole that. And so I wanted to share the scripture today. All that came before me were thieves and robbers. (laughs) Okay, everybody knows. You need to explain (laughs) this. You need to explain it if they don't know. So I want to recommend a good book, uh, Army of God Rising. By who? uh, By who? uh, Mark Mark Howard, Howard, I think. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) So no, I, I appreciate you and appreciate your book, and you'd already got that title. So I really, I'm not coveting or anything like that. That's a great title and a great book. So, I love but it. but we had this title seriously in our heart from the beginning, and 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 the end of Spectator Church 
you know, we live in a spectator society. Mm. We're trained by our culture yeah. to be spectators. You know, um, we watch everybody's life, you know, people that watch dramas and whatever, you know, they watch their life on television, people that like sports, you know, that how many, you might have 80,000 people in the stadium and 22 guys on the field and millions more at home watching on TV, very few participants, but myriads of spectators. And I just wonder how much of our culture uh, has has carried into a mindset that when people come to church, it's like, you know, we're used to celebrities, we're used to entertainers, we're used to performers, athletes, but it's always somebody else doing the stuff, and 99% of the people are spectators. That's just a lot of what our society is about. And yet when it comes into church, it was never, ever supposed to be that way. You know, when you look at the Bible, God's plan was, first of all, you know, God does stuff for us. You know, Jesus went to the cross and died for us, rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Whether we ever receive that or accept that or not, it was done for us. When we say yes to God, then he does something in us. We're born again. You know, before that conviction uh, brought to repentance, uh, faith, um, uh, we're, we're receive new life through Christ. Uh, we receive the assurance of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God, even the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, God does stuff for us. Then when we allow him, he does stuff I shouldn't say stuff. You yeah. know, he does wonderful works, right. works of grace and works of love and redemption in us. And then if we allow him to, he wants to do something through us. Yeah. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. You know, the Dead Sea in Israel, you've been to Israel. You know, the Dead Sea is dead because it has an inlet, but it has no outlet. And for me, growing up in church, I grew up, and I don't mean to be critical because I'm thankful for the yeah. things I learned in my upbringing, but I never had any concept of church involvement other than just attending, attending a service. And I'm thankful I attended services, but I never realized that there, and maybe I didn't pay attention. Maybe it's my fault. I'm not going to blame somebody else, but I never knew that there was a, an activation that was supposed to take place that, first of all, an impartation, then a transformation, then uh, an activation that God wanted to put something in me so that he could get something out of me. And so when we talk about the end of spectator church, what we're really talking about is a change of mindset that every person who is in Christ, every person who is faithfully, actively a part of the body of Christ, and, and you and I both believe very strongly that we need to get together, that Christianity was never designed to be an, a, a, a solo sport, an isolated individual activity. Yes, we have a personal relationship sure. with God, but but how much of the New Testament is written to the body of believers, to the church at Ephesus, you know, to the saints at Colossae? Um, you know, the Bible presupposes that we will be assembling together and fellowshipping with one another and serving one another. And, and, and not only serving within the church, but then having a, an expression in our neighborhoods, in our lives, in our communities, no Christian was meant to be a mere spectator. And I love the analogy that you bring out, <clears throat> because really our culture has trained us. Mm -hmm. You got 22 guys on the field and thousands watching and millions more by, you know, internet and things like that. And yet... There has to be that outlet. You know, <clears throat> I actually was in the Dead Sea. You know, Linda didn't want to go in. Mm -hmm. But you can't sink in there. It is so salty. Right. You could literally lay on your back and read a newspaper, and a little bit of water splashed. I think it's six times saltier yeah. than, than water in the ocean. Mm -hmm. 
And it is. It's dead for one reason. It takes in but has no outlet. Yeah. You have something here that, and by the way, I've got Tony's book in an ebook format. So the end of Spectator Church, I feel it's a must read for believers. Uh, this is a key, mm -hmm. Tony. And But you have a quote from Charles Spurgeon that you cannot improve on this. It needs to be framed. Every believer needs to be exposed to this. And, you know, they called him the prince of preachers. They did. Yeah. Profound ability to preach. Mm -hmm. and But he said, so now if you love the Lord, if you have only just believed in him, begin to do something, believe to do something for him at once. It is a pity that we have so many Christian people, so-called, who do nothing for Christ, literally nothing. He dies for them, as you said, Tony, redeems them with his precious blood, and they've done nothing for him in return. We need to have a church in which all the members do something, in which all do all they can, in which all are always doing all they can, for this is what our Lord deserves to have from a living, loving people bought with his precious blood. If he has saved me, I will serve him forever and ever, and whatever lies in my power to do for his glory, that shall be my delight to do and to do at once. Tony, that, mm -hmm. that is one of the more powerful quotes I've ever read. Yeah. If, if, if people could have that mindset, instead of just the mindset, what's in this for me? I'm going to go to church, or I'm going to watch the podcast, or I'm going to watch the live stream, or I'm going to read this book for personal benefit. That's fine, but it's not the whole proposition. The whole proposition is freely you have received freely give. And I think, Pastor Mark, where a lot of people um, kind of get paralyzed, and if I can use that word paralysis, you know, with some appropriate respect and sensitivity, the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. And that's a metaphor, that's an analogy that's used. But, you know, and Paul talks about how we have different members in the body, and the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you, and the ear can't say to the hand, I'm probably getting the body parts all turned around, but but we need, you know, the hand can do things that the ear can't, the ear can do things that the foot can't. We're different, you know, but but we're unified in one body. And if we are the body of Christ, think about this in the earth. We know Jesus is the head of the church. That's the big message of Colossians. Yeah. Christ is the head of the church. And in Romans and Ephesians, we find out we're the body of Christ. And a beautiful picture. But if we are the body of Christ, and let's say that 25%, just a random number, 25% of Christians have said, I'm a child of God. I'm not just here to receive but I, I need to do something to serve others. I need to be a blessing to others. Um, as I've received from God, I want to give to others. I want to follow Jesus' example of servanthood. Um, you know, I don't just want to go to church and sit and get something and leave. I want to give something when I go to church. And not just talking about money, but money's a part of the whole equation. But let's say 25% of Christians have adopted the mentality that I'm called to serve God. That means 75% don't. So if we're the body of Christ, how would you be doing if 75% of your body didn't work? They would call You're that paralyzed. a disability. Called a think. severe disability. You know, if, if only 25% of your body was functioning. And so when we understand what God wants to do through the body of Christ in the earth, how he wants to express himself in the earth, but he's working with a body that's 20, uh, only 25% functional and 75% paralyzed. You know, what does that say about how much are we achieving for the glory of God? You know, that harvest you talked about, the harvest is, you know, the fields are wide unto harvest and uh, they must be reaped and, and that type of thing. So, uh, we need every believer to be a part. I need my little toe to be functioning. I need, um, you know, my I need my elbow to be working. 
Uh, I need my little finger to be able to do what whatever my little finger can do. Um, we need the whole body of Christ. And sometimes people think, I think we have a, this idea that preachers are the only ones that are important. That, you know, the guy behind the pulpit, the guy with the Bible preaching, telling all of us about God, and the rest of us are just spectators. And, and really, um, the Bible says that pastors, along with the apostle, prophet, evangelist, and the, the let's say, teacher. apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, all five of the gifts are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. The, the preachers are not to entertain the saints, to equip the saints to do something, and that involves serving. Thank you for watching this video and be sure to explore more of my YouTube channel for more content like this. And if you want to learn more about what we do, or if you want to partner with us, be sure to visit my website at markcoward.org. May the Lord bless you richly.